Now, we've been talking about the second coming of Christ. And the question that we've been exploring is whether or not there is one return of Christ or multiple returns of Christ. And for the past two weeks, we've been looking at the so-called rapture view, which holds that there are, in fact, multiple returns of Christ, that the final, decisive, visible return of Christ to earth will be preceded by an invisible, secret coming of Christ to take away the church out of the world prior to the Great Tribulation. I noticed that the song that we sang this morning from Wesley, Lo, He Comes on Clouds Descending, was unambiguously a non-rapture him, uh, because it described the visible return of Christ when uh, Christians would be caught up in the air to meet the Lord when he returns and he visibly establishes his kingdom on earth. By contrast, the wonderful hymn that the choir sang in the service this morning, did you notice, was ambiguous as to whether that was describing a rapture theology or was that describing the second coming of Christ. People of both views could enjoy that hymn this morning um, and interpret it according to their own theological view. Now today we come to a second interpretation that also holds to multiple returns of Christ and this is the preterist view. Preterism says that the uh, return of Christ predicted by Jesus in the Olivet Discourse has already occurred. Okay, if you need an outline, raise your hands, and Amy will deliver one to you. Keep your hands up if you need an outline. You may have heard um, from your English teacher when she taught you English grammar something about the past preterite tense. The idea there is something that's in the past. Um, and this is what the preterist thinks with regard to the return of Christ. According to the preterist, the coming of the Son of Man that Jesus predicted in the Olivet Discourse has in fact already occurred. It occurred in A.D. 70 with the destruction of Jerusalem. And with that event, the Son of Man was enthroned in heaven. This view was defended by the notable New Testament scholar C.B. Caird, also by the late R.T. France, a fine uh, New Testament scholar, and most notably perhaps today by N.T. Wright, a very well-known and highly respected New Testament scholar. Now, according to this interpretation, the events of the Olivet Discourse that Jesus predicted are not end time events at all. Rather, these predictions were fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 by the Roman legions. The descriptions of the great tribulation that Jesus refers to um, was in fact the horror of the Roman siege of Jerusalem, which as we know from the descriptions of Josephus really was indeed terrifying, a horrible uh, siege as people began even to eat their own children, to cannibalize uh, one another in order to stay alive under that terrible Roman siege. In verse 13, um, verses 24 to 25, or pardon me, chapter 13, verses 24 to 25 of Mark, we have a description in apocalyptic imagery of the coming of the Son of Man. Jewish apocalyptic literature was literature about um, the advent of God or the judgment of God that would often be characterized in highly symbolic imagery. 
And so the uh, description that we have in Mark 13, 24 to 25, is taken to be such an apocalyptic, uh, symbolic account. There we read, Mark 13, 24 to 27, but in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, and then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. And the preterist says this is not a literal description of astronomical events. This is a description of the events uh, in AD 70 um, and the presentation of the Son of Man before God uh, in this apocalyptic symbolism. Compare, for example, Isaiah 13.10. Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 10. In these verses, as you see from verse 1, this is a prophecy concerning Babylon and the destruction of Babylon. And in uh, verse 10, Isaiah says, For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising, and the moon will not shed its light. Very similar sort of imagery that you have in Jesus' Olivet Discourse. Or turn over to Ezekiel chapter 32 and verse 7. Ezekiel chapter 32 and verse 7. This is, as you can see from the first and second verse, a prophecy concerning the, uh, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And in verse um, 7, Ezekiel says, When I blot you out, I will cover the heavens and make their stars dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give its light. All the bright lights of heaven I will make dark over you and put darkness upon your land, says the Lord God. So here in Ezekiel as well, we have this astronomical language used in symbolism for the judgment of God coming upon Egypt. Now, lest anyone think this should be taken literally, turn over to Acts chapter 2 and verses 19 to 20. Acts chapter 2, 19 to 20, is part of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. And you'll remember what people experienced there was hearing the disciples speaking in other languages, and there were tongues of fire resting upon their shoulders. And in verse 19 of chapter 2, um, Peter explains that this is what was uh, spoken of by the prophet Joel, verse 16. And then he quotes Joel's prophecy from the Old Testament. And I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and manifest day. Clearly those things weren't literally happening on the day of Pentecost, and yet Peter says this is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel. It is apocalyptic imagery describing the sort of earth-shaking significance of the events that God was bringing to pass. So this uh, description of the destruction of Jerusalem and the coming of the Son of Man um, that is cast in this astronomical image uh, shouldn't be taken in a literal sense as the preterist. Moreover, if you turn back to Daniel chapter 7, where the coming of the Son of Man is predicted, they will point out that this is not a description of the coming of the Son of Man to earth. 
Rather, it is a description of the presentation of the Son of Man before God in the throne room of heaven. In Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and following, Daniel says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. So what we have in Daniel is the coming of the Son of Man into the throne room of heaven and his presentation before Yahweh, before God, who then delivers to the Son of Man all kingdom, uh, authority, and dominion. So, the coming of the Son of Man that Jesus predicts in chapter 13 of Mark is not meant to be a sort of visible return of Christ to the earth, but rather his enthronement in heaven. What about the gathering of the elect from the four winds, however, where he sends out his angels to gather the elect? Well, the preterist would say this is, again, in symbolic terms, the prediction of the worldwide preaching of the gospel and the gathering of this great harvest for the kingdom of God from every nation in the world. They will all be brought into the kingdom of Christ through the preaching of the gospel. Now, this is certainly an interesting interpretation of the Olivet Discourse, but I think that what really drives this view hasn't been mentioned so far. What really drives this view, I'm persuaded, is verse 30 of uh, Mark 13, where Jesus says, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away before all these things take place. The preterist wants to solve the problem of the delay of the parousia by saying all of these events predicted by Jesus did take place in the lifetime of his hearers. They did occur just as Jesus predicted they would in verse 30 within the lifetime of those who heard Jesus. So that these uh, events literally occurred and Jesus' prophecy literally was fulfilled. Now, what might we say uh, by way of assessment of this interpretation? Well, I think we have to say that initially um, this is a, an attractive view because it solves the very knotty problem of verse 30, where Jesus says all these things uh, will take place before this generation passes away. You don't have to do any fancy um, explaining away of that verse because they literally all did happen. So this makes the, the interpretation, I think, initially attractive. But I have to confess that after thinking about it, and, and with all the best will in the world, um, being quite open to it, I just can't buy it uh, at the end of the day. I'm just not persuaded that this is the correct interpretation of Jesus' teachings. Like the rapture view, in the end, the preterist view also winds up positing an invisible coming of the Son of Man prior to his second final coming to earth to establish his kingdom. So that preterism, like the rapture view, winds up postulating multiple returns of Christ. Now how, the, how might this be seen? Well let me make a few points about this. First of all, it seems to me <clears throat> that according to Jesus and according to the New Testament, Paul as well, the coming of the Son of Man is a visible coming to earth. The coming of the Son of Man predicted by Jesus is a visible coming to the earth. Notice that the verb to come is a perspectival word. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean when somebody comes, that represents the situation of the speaker. Somebody comes to you. Um, if you want 
to describe how you go to them, you use the verb go instead. You don't say, I, I come to them, I, I go to them, they come to me. Come and go are perspectival words, sort of like here and there. Here is where somebody comes, uh, there is where somebody goes. Um, to see how this is used in the New Testament, look at Acts chapter 1 and verse 11. This is a very good illustration, I think, of the perspectival nature of coming and going. Here, the angels say to the disciples who are standing about having just witnessed Jesus' ascension, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. You will see him come just as you saw him go into heaven. So when Jesus in Mark 13 talks about the coming of the Son of Man, this is a description of his coming to earth. It's where we will uh, see him and experiencing him, experience him. The language of the coming of the Son of Man indicates that he's coming to the place where the observer is. Now, what that means then is that Jesus coming to earth uh, that is described is going to be visible and public. It's going to be observed. It's not going to be some secret invisible event. Look at Mark 13 and verse 26. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. The people who are on earth will see the Son of Man coming with great power and glory. Also, if you look at um, Mark chapter 14, the trial of Jesus, you have on Jesus' own lips similar words. Mark 14, verses 61 to 62. Mark 14, 61 to 62. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Here he says to the Sanhedrin, You will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, just as he said in the Olivet Discourse. Now, notice that this is in sharp contrast to the false messiahs that are predicted in Mark 13 in the Olivet Discourse, where someone will say, here is the Christ, or, or there is the Christ. Um, as Robert Gundry points out in his commentary, the distinction between the true coming of Christ and these false messiahs will be in the public visible demonstrative nature of Christ's uh, real coming. These false messiahs come in deceptive, private ways, which are seen but by a few. But the coming of the Son of Man described by Jesus is a public, overpowering event that will be overwhelmingly evident to everyone. Compare in this connection Matthew's uh, description of the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, verses 26 to 27. Matthew chapter 24, verses 26 to 27. There, Jesus says, For false Christs and prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders so as to lead astray if possible, even the elect. Lo, I have hold you be, told you beforehand. So if they say to you, Lo, he is in the wilderness, do not go. If they say, Lo, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. It's going to be a visible, overwhelming event that everyone will see, not something that takes place privately in the inner rooms or out in the desert, as these false Christs claim. Also, 
Look at Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7 to see that this was the view that the early church held as well. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. This is the same language, isn't it? He is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, everyone who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. So this is a public uh, event that will be witnessed by all people. So if that's right, what that means is that the coming of the Son of Man that is predicted by Jesus is not some invisible secret thing that took place in A.D. 70 that nobody saw. It, w it will be a public, visible, overwhelming advent of the Son of Man to earth that will be experienced by everyone. It seems to me much more evident that what's described is the coming of the Son of Man as king and conqueror, the, the glorious return of Christ to the earth um, as the uh, risen and conquering Lord. Finally, number three. <clears throat> it seems to be that the real Achilles heel of the preterist view is once again the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection of the dead. Paul, in his letters, looks forward to the parousia. Remember, all of these letters were written prior to AD 70. Paul was martyred somewhere in the mid-AD 60s. Uh, his Thessalonian correspondence, where he describes at length the appearing and coming of uh, the Son of Man was some of the earliest material in the New Testament, written around A.D. 51, from Corinth to the churches, or to the church in Thessalonica, and Paul looks forward to the parousia of Christ and the resurrection of the dead at his return. Now, obviously, the resurrection of the dead didn't occur in A.D. 70. So, what? preterists are forced to say is that what Paul is looking forward to in describing as the coming of the Son of Man is not the event that took place in AD 70, but rather an event that will occur at the end of history when Christ comes back once again and then the dead will be raised. So I remember at a conference at which N.T. Wright was speaking, someone asked him, if you believe that the coming of the Son of Man occurred in A.D. 70, what about the resurrection of the dead? Uh, do you think that that is already past? And Wright responded, of course not. I think Christ will come again at the end of the, the age, and then the dead will be raised. So you see, you wind up doing exactly what the rapture folks had to do. You have to postulate that Paul isn't talking about the same event that Jesus is talking about in the Olivet Discourse, despite the commonality of vocabulary and the, the connections between the two, um, what Paul is really talking about in Thessalonians and his other correspondence is this end time event, not the event that Jesus predicted in the Olivet Discourse, which occurred in AD 70. And that seems to me to be just extremely ad hoc and artificial. Uh, it seems to me that the natural interpretation of Paul's uh, teaching is that he is talking about the same event when Christ will return as the Son of Man, the dead will be raised, the angels will gather the elect from the four corners of the earth, and they will welcome Christ back to earth to uh, establish his kingdom visibly. So, Again, um, with all the best will in the world, at the end of the day, I just don't buy preterism. It would be nice if it were true because it would solve the problem of the delay of the parousia so adroitly, but it seems to me that this interpretation is implausible.